advising clients across Cape Cod and across the country. Here he is, your host, Jay Christopher Boyd. Hi, everybody. Chris Boyd here with something more for your financial well-being. You know, one of the things that people often think about is, how do I determine who to hire as a financial advisor? What are the things I should be thinking about? And so I thought today I'd give you some tips or some thoughts as you might uh, be, uh, when, you, when you do address that question, that might be helpful to you in that process. So one of the things that uh, there's been a lot of attention about lately is uh, the standards to which a professional, a financial professional is held. In, uh, in many cases, there's two standards that we kind of focus on. One is the standard of suitability, and the other is that of a fiduciary. Uh, the suitability standard is simply one that when the product was sold to the client, it seemed like a good idea at the time. There, there was a reasonable basis to make that uh, suggestion of that product. Um, whereas a fiduciary standard is, is this in the client's best interest? Was this uh, decision that was made on the client's behalf or for the client, uh, with the client, was it ultimately in their best interest or at least seemed reasonable to expect that that, that was the case? So for most people, I don't know about you, but I think I would prefer to have someone who is more of a fiduciary, really trying to look out for my best interest, than someone who's selling a product that could be more or less seemed reasonable at the time. Um, so that is sort of part of the framework as you think about this when you look to a financial advisor. An outflow of that is how are they compensated? What is the structure, the business channel that they work within? Uh, now there's good and bad advisors in any kind of um, channel and just like in any industry there's good and bad people to work with and you're just trying to figure out who's a good person that you're going to work with and there's plenty of people that are good professionals that work in both channels but I think you do have some benefits by thinking about working with someone who is in a financial planning kind of perspective as opposed to someone who works let's say for a broker dealer who is a registered representative what does that mean they represent the broker dealer uh, so that is their first uh, you know structure of the process so they're basically typically uh, by nature a salesperson for that company um, now that's not to say that many registered reps aren't also very good in terms of being on the, a client's advocate but it does put you with a sort of slightly different structure to the process so we generally encourage people to think about working with a certified financial planner um, Broker-dealer registered representatives are uh, selling product generally and uh, uh, held to the suitability standard, whereas investment advisors have a, uh, a fiduciary uh, uh, standard that they're required to uphold. And that's true for certified financial planners as well. Uh, they've taken various educational courses work before being eligible to sit for an exam. If they pass the exam, they also have ethics and continuing education requirements. So those are good things to be looking for. Um, one of the things that you also need to think about when looking at this issue is compensation. How are people compensated? With uh, most financial advisors, it's fees is how they're compensated for, um, or that is to say for investment advisors. And that's, uh, there can be people who work for a broker dealer, but are under the investment advisor rules as well. So you do have to get into the details. But for people who are paid through a broker dealer, they're paid by commission. And there are certain types of uh, products that sell or that can be paying certain kinds of commissions. For example, uh, mutual funds are probably the most common type of investment that people use that pays a commission. Uh, but you, it, whatever product you might use, you want to understand how much commission or sales charge is uh, being charged against you, and how does that work? We sometimes refer to sale charges as uh, the A, Bs, and Cs. A shares, B shares, and C shares. Each has different kinds of structure, and when you look at this, you want to look at not only the sales charge, whether it's a front-end load, a deferred contingent sales charge, or a back-end load sometimes called, uh, or whether there's some combination uh, as well as the internal costs. The uh, in embedded expense ratio can be very different from within different classes of shares. Um, when it comes to a financial advisor, if you work with an investment advisor who's paid by fees, uh, you want to think about uh, the different ways they could be compensated. 
And this is usually detailed in an engagement that you might sign when you hire them, but ultimately there can be fees by the hour, or most common is either fees by the hour or an assets under management where they charge a percentage relative to the amount they control for your investments. Um, both of these have merit and different kinds of circumstances can warrant uh, which one is preferable. I think in most cases it's the degree to which you want to delegate the activity of the ongoing services to the advisor. If you're doing things where you're coming in just getting advice from time to time, an hourly arrangement makes a lot of sense. If you're looking to have an advisor to actually manage your money ongoing or give you ongoing advice, uh, an asset-based structure makes more sense there. Um, in many cases, uh, people sometimes will ask about a performance-based fee structure. Would I be benefited by uh, having my fees tied to, if I make so much or more, you get some percentage of what we make? Um, we generally shy away from those and encourage investors to shy away from those because the reality is that it creates an incentive for your advisor to uh, take on more risk. Uh, if they only get paid if they make a certain level of return, uh, they take more risk. And if they don't make the money, it might work against you because you might end up, uh, if, if there's losses, they're not getting paid anyway. So it's not something that we think is a good idea. All right, so those are a few things for you. I hope that's helpful. Give us a call if you have any questions as it might relate to thinking about these uh, choices you might be making. We'd love to talk to you here at Asset Management Resources. Thanks for being with me.